Okay, a quick update or reminder, if you don't want to sit through uh, the entire video, you don't have to. So what I'll do is <laughs> um, I will put points of interest at the end of the video. Like, you know, anything that I thought was uh, interesting or cool, uh, we'll include it at the end of the video in like a little memo, uh, you know, Part of the video. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of debating on how to do this, maybe in a text form, maybe me talking, you know, uh, I can point out the page number and, um, you know, leave it at the end because I want to, look, I want to make sure that people out there, uh, you know, tune in for this and get interested in this because this book, The Day After Roswell, it's an amazing book. It really is. Um, and you guys know, I'm not, I'm not one to buy all the you know, the, the UFO BS, you know, I, I like to refer to myself uh, or think of myself as a debunker first and a UFO guy second. Um, but this book really has, you know, kind of opened my eyes to the Roswell incident. So, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, you know, thank you for tuning in. And again, at the end of the video, you can find important cliff notes. Okay, so chapter 7, the EBE. This is an incredible chapter, by the way. Okay, therefore, we need to consider the EBEs as described in the medical autopsy report. Humanoid robots rather than life forms specifically engineered for long-distance travel through space and time. A hot Washington summer morning had already settled over the Potomac like a wet towel on the day I wrapped up the first of my reports for General Trudeau. And what a report it was. It set the tone for all the other reports and recommendations I was to make to the General over the next two years. It began with the biggest find, the alien extraterrestrial itself. Had I not read the medical, medical examiner's report, of the alien from Walter Reed with my own eyes and reviewed the 1947 army photographs and sketches I would have called any description of this creature pure science fiction that had I not seen either this or its twin okay talking about the twin ET had I not seen this or its twin suspended in a transparent crypt at Fort Riley so he's talking about uh, you know, seeing this, this, this alien at Fort Riley suspended in, in midair. I mean, this is crazy, guys. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, but here it was again, just a yellowing piece of paper and a few cracked glossy prints in a brown folder sitting among scores of odds and ends, bits of debris, and very odd devices in my file. Even more odd to me than the medical examiner's report was my reaction. What what could we exploit from this entity? I wrote the general that whether we found an extraterrestrial biological entity is not important in the R&D arena, as are the ways we can develop, well, as the ways we can develop what we learn from it so that man can travel through space. Now, remember, this was before uh, the Apollo program, before Gemini. This is... Uh, you know, 47 or, 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 you know, shortly after. Okay. Let me, let me back up here. This quickly became the overriding concern with all of the Roswell artifacts and the general format for all of my reports. Once I swallow back the, Oh wow. Aspect of all of this life altering info. And sometimes it took a very big swallow. I could imagine. I was still left with the job of sorting out what looked promising for R&D to develop from what seemed beyond our realistic grasp for the present. I began with the EBE. The medical report and supporting photographs in front of me suggested the creature was remarkably well adapted 
Wow, well adapted for long distance space travel. For example, biological time, the Walter Reed Medical Examiner's hypothe hypothesized must have passed very slowly for the entity because it possessed a very slow metabolism. Evidence, they said, by the enormous capacities of the huge heart lungs, the physiology of this thing indicated that this was not a creature whose body had to work hard to sustain itself. I mean, just think about that, guys. Not hard to sustain itself. A larger heart, my Ilmi's report read, meant that it took fewer beats than a human heart to drive thin, milky, almost lymphatic-like fluid through a limited, more primitive-looking, and apparently reduced capacity circulatory system. As a result, the biological clock beat more slowly than a human's and probably allowed the creature to travel through great distances in a shorter biological time than humans. The heart was very decomposed by the time the Walter Reed pathologists got their hands on it. It seemed to them that our atmosphere was quite toxic to the alien's organs. Given the time that passed between the crash of the vehicles and the creature's arrival at Walter Reed, it decomposed all of the organs far more rapidly than it would have decomposed human organs. This fact particularly impressed me because I had seen one of these things, if not the very one described in the report, suspended in a gel-like substance at Fort Riley. So whatever exposure it must have had was very minimal by human standards because the medical personnel at the 509th Walker Field got into a liquid preservation state very quickly. Nevertheless, the Walter Reed pathologists were unable to determine with any certainty the structure of the creature's heart except to guess that because it functioned as a passive blood storage facility, Wow, uh, as well as pumping as a pumping muscle that it didn't work the same way as did our four-chambered human heart. They said the alien heart seemed to have had had internal diagra diagram-like muscles that worked less hard than the human heart muscle did because the creatures were meant to survive within a reduced gravity field as we understand gravity as camels store water so did this alien store whatever atmosphere it breathed in the large capacity of its lungs the lungs function in ways similar to a camel's hump or to our scuba tanks and released atmosphere very slowly into the creature's system. Because of the large heart and the storage function we believed it had, we also summarized that it took far less breathable atmosphere to sustain the creature, thereby reducing the need for carrying large volumes of atmosphere along on the voyage. Per uh, perhaps the aircraft had a means of recirculating its atmosphere, recycling spent or waste air back into the craft. Moreover, because the creatures were, were only four or so feet tall, <laughs> wow, um, the large lung occupied a far greater percentage of the chest cavity than human lungs did. Further, impressing the pathologist to ex examine the creature's remains. This also indicated to us that perhaps we were dealing with an entity specifically engineered for long distance space travel. If we believe the heart and lung seemed bioengineered for long distance travel, so too was the creature's skeletal tissue. Although it was in a state of advanced de uh, decomposition, the creature's bones looked to the army medical examiners to be fibrous, thinner than the comparable human bones such as the ribs, sternum, clavicle, and, pel uh, and pelvis. Pathologists speculated that the bones were, were more flexible than human bones and had a resiliency that might be related to the function of shock absorbers. More brittle human bones might more easily shatter under the stresses these alien entities must have been routinely subjected to. However, with a flexible skeletal frame, the entities appeared well suited for potential shock and physical trauma. The military recovery team at the Roswell site had reported that the two aliens still alive after the crash had difficulty breathing our atmosphere. Whatever that was, because they were suddenly tossed out of the aircraft, unprotected into our gravity envelope, or whether the atmosphere itself was toxic to them, we don't know. We also don't know whether the creature who died very shortly after the crash was struggling to breathe because he was fatally wounded by gunshots or because 
other reasons, military witnesses recounted different stories about the creatures that survived and tried to run. Some of them said it was struggling to breathe from the moment the military had secured the, the area. Others said it was gasping only after it had been shot. Wow, that's just sad, really shot by uh, one of our military officers. My guess was that it was the, my guess was that it was the alien's sudden exposure to the Earth's strong gravity that caused the creature to panic at first that could have been one reason his breathing seemed labor. Then after he fled, well, I mean, this, I can't, I just, I'm thinking about this. I can't believe they would actually just shoot this alien. Then after he fled and was shot, he was struggling to breathe because of his wounds. The medical examiner, the Emmy report mentioned nothing about toxic gases or the kind of atmosphere, atmosphere he believed the creatures naturally breathe. If the Roswell craft were a scout or surveillance vehicle, as the military analyst back at Wright believed, then it was also more, more than likely that the creature's never intended to exit the craft. Wow. This was a craft equipped with a device that was capable of penetrating our nighttime or utilizing the temperature differentials of different objects to create a visual image enabling the occupants to navigate and observe in darkness. And because it could elude our interceptors and appeared and disappeared on our radar screens at will, we believe that the occupant simply stayed inside and observed rather than roamed about. Perhaps other types of craft or aliens deployed from the same culture were equipped to land and carry out missions and therefore had breathing and anti-gravity apparatus on board for its crew that permitted them to exit the craft without suffering any consequences. The medical examiners didn't speculate on this. What did intrigue those who inspected the aircraft once it was shipped to Wright Field, okay, keep that in mind, guys, Wright Field was the complete absence of any food preparation facilities. At a time when space travel was a science fiction writer's fantasy, military analysts were already at work formulating ideas for just how such a technology could be practically implemented. It was not for travel to any other planets, but for navigation around the Earth because the Germans were developing as an extension of their v2 rocket program if you're going to put an airman into earth orbit how do you process their waste products provide adequate oxygen and sustain them during prolonged periods clearly after you've developed a launch vehicle with enough thrust to put a craft into low earth orbit keeping it there long enough for it to accomplish a mission is the next problem to tackle the roswell craft seemed to have tackled it because somehow it got here from somewhere else but there was no indication of how such household problems as food prep and the disposal of waste were solved there was much more speculation from the different medical a analysts about what these beings were composed of and what could have sustained them First of all, doctors were more tantalized by the similarities the creatures shared with us than they were concerned about the differences. Rather than hideous-looking insects or the reptilian man-eating, <laughs> the reptilian man-eaters that attacked Earth in War of the Worlds, awesome by the way, uh, these beings looked like little versions of us, only different. It was eerie. Look, <laughs> while doctors couldn't figure out how the entities essential body chemistry worked they determined that they contained no new basic elements however the reports that i suggested new combinations of organic compounds that required much more elevation before doctors could form any opinions of specific interest was the fluid that served as blood but also seemed to regulate body functions in much more the same way glandular sec secretions <laughs> do for the human body uh, in these biological ent entities, the blood system and lymphatic system seem to have been combined. And if an exchange of nutrients and waste occurred within their systems, that, that exchange could have only taken place through the creature's skin or the other protective coverings they wore because there were no digestive or waste systems. The medical examiner's report revealed that the creatures were enclosed within a one-piece protective covering like a jumpsuit or spacesuit. They're talking about the skin of the alien or the outer skin in which the atoms were aligned so as to provide a great tensile strength and flexibility. One examiner wrote that it reminded him of a spider's web. You guys know they make... Um, 
you know, bulletproof vest and things like that out of spider's web. Sorry, spider's web. Spider web. <laughs> okay, so the creature's spacesuit or outer skin appeared to be stretched out um, as if it were literally spun over the alien and seized up around it, providing a protective skin tight protective fit. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, the lengthwise alignment of the fibers in the suit also prompted the medical analysis to suggest that the suit might have been capable of protecting the wearer, the alien, against the low-energy cosmic rays that would routinely bombard any craft during space flight or space journey. Um, the interior organs of the creature seem to be fragile and oversized that the Walter Reed medical analysis imagined that without the suit, the entity, the alien... Would, would have been vulnerable to cumulative, cumulative physical trauma from a constant particle energy uh, bombardment. Uh, that's crazy. So basically they're saying this suit protected uh, the alien. You know, and I called it uh, to a friend of mine, um, almost like a, what do they call it? Like an automated pilot, right? Like a biological autopilot you know like these other superior beings they they created these grays or aliens whatever you want to call them to go out on these scout trips you know from the mothership i know this sounds crazy uh you know to planet earth and they they had these suits to protect them i mean this I, look i know this sounds crazy but again you got to remember this is coming from corso you know a man uh that was there okay so let's continue uh, let's see, where did we leave off at? Uh, da, da, da. Okay, right here. The Walter Reed doctors were also fascinated by the natures of the creature's inner skin. It resembled, although their preliminary reports didn't go into chemical analysis, a thin layer of fatty tissue unlike anything they'd ever seen before. And it was completely permeable as if it were constantly... Uh, exchanging chemicals back and forth with the combination blood lymphatic system was this the way the alien nourished themselves during the, the space journeys and was this how waste was processed remember uh, they said it didn't have like a digestive system or anything like that neither the right field engineers nor the Walter Reed medical examiners had any explanation for the lack of waste disposal on board the craft I mean the detail they go into uh, nor could they explain how the alien's waste was processed. Maybe I was speculating too far about robots and androids. I don't think so, buddy. Uh, when I was writing my report for General Trudeau, but I kept thinking also that the skin analysis that I was reading sounded more akin to the skin of a house plant than the skin of a human being. That too could have been another explanation for the lack of food or waste facilities. Much of the attention during the preliminary and latter autopsies of the aliens focused on the size nature and, and anatomy of their brains okay this is where i think they're about to get into you know the headbands uh, that the aliens were wearing okay so this next part kind of gets to me a little bit so i'm going to kind of read it um slowly they received impressions from the dying alien that it was suffering and in great pain no one ever heard that the alien make a sound so any impressions army intelligence personnel assumed would have to have been created through some type of em em emphatic protection or outright mental telepathy but witnesses said they heard no words in their mind only the resonance of a shared or projected impression much similar than a sentence but far more complex because they were able to share with the creatures a sense not only of suffering but of profound sadness so they're talking about um you know when they when they arrived okay uh, and they were in close proximity to the aliens they felt profound sadness and suffering i mean it's just terrible um but they were able to show creatures of and suffering and profound sadness as if it were mourning for the others who had died on aboard the craft so like the alien was was mourning for his his family that had died these witnesses reported intrigued me more than any other info we took from the from the roswell crash site the medical examiners believe that the alien brain way oversized in comparison you know you're talking about uh you know to the human brain uh, comparison with the human brain and in proportion to the creature's tiny stature had four distinct sections the creature 
the creatures, the aliens, were dead, and the brains had become, become the brains had begun to decompose by the time they were removed from the soft, spongy skulls. I mean, that's kind of creepy too. The soft, spongy skulls. Talking about the aliens, they felt um, they that felt to the doctors more like platal cartilage than the hard bone of a human cranium. Wow. I mean, the, the detail that this goes into, uh, even had the aliens been alive when they were examined, 1940, 1947 medical technology did not have ultrasound scanning or the high resonance uh, tom tomography, I don't know what that is, of today's ra radiology labs. Accordingly, there, were no, there was no way for the doctors to evaluate the nature of the cranial lobes or spheres, as they called them in the report. Thus, despite the rampant speculation about the nature of the creature's brains, thought pro <laughs> projection or psychokinetic powers, pff, what? Psychokinetic powers and the like, no hard evidence existed of anything, and the reports were very light on real scientific data. Suffice it to say that in a few hours, the material was at Walker Field in Roswell. More than one officer at the 509th slipped this thing over his head and tried to figure out what it did. At first, it did nothing. There were no buttons, no switches, no wires, nothing that could even be considered to have been a control panel. So no one knew how to turn it on or off. Moreover, the band was not really adjustable, though it had enough elasticity to have been one size fits all for the aliens whose skulls were large enough to accommodate them. However, the reports I read stated the few officers whose heads were just large enough, okay, uh, just large enough to have made contact with the full array of the conductors got the shock of their lives. So basically, these officers put this uh, headband on and it's saying they got the shock of their lives. Uh, let's see. In their descriptions of the headband, these officers reported everything from low, a low tingling sensation inside their heads to a searing headache, almost a migraine, and a brief array of either dancing or exploding colors on the inside of their eyelids as they rotated the, the device around their head and brought the sensors into contact with different parts of their brain and skull. The eyewitnesses' report suggested to me that the sensors stimulated certain parts of the brain while at the same time exchanged information with the brain. Again, using the analogy of the EEG, these devices were very sophisticated mechanisms for translating the electrical impulses inside the creature's brain into specific commands. So again, this is how they flew the UFOs with these bands, is what Corso is saying here. Perhaps, he goes on to say, perhaps these headband devices compromised the pilot's interface of the ship's navigational and propulsional systems combined with a long-range communications device. At first, I didn't know. But it was only when we began development of the low brainwave research project toward the end of my tenure at the Pentagon that I realized just what we had. It took a long time to harvest this technology, but 50 years after Roswell, versions of this device eventually became component of the, of the navigational controls for some of the Army's most sophisticated helicopters and will soon be the American consumer electronics market as U.S. input devices personal for personal computer games. The first Army Air Force analysis and engineers, both at the 509th and Wright Field, were also believed by the lack of are also be bedeviled, excuse me, bedeviled by the lack of any traditional controls and propulsion systems in the crashed vehicle. Looking at their reports and the artifacts from the perspective of 1961, however, I imagine that the keys to understanding what made the craft go up and directed its flight lie not only within the craft itself, but in the relationship between the pilot and the craft. If we hypothesize a brainwave guidance system that was as specific to the pilot's electric si electronic signature as it was to the spacecraft, then, we, then we're looking at an entirely revolutionary concept of guided flight in which the pilot was the system. So similar to... Um, you know, today's flight controls. Similar, I think. Okay, it goes on to say, imagine transportation devices in which the key to the ignition is a di digitalized code derived from your electro <laughs> electronic graphic something signature 
Uh, <laughs> that is a long word. <laughs> and it's read automatically upon your doning some sort of sensorized headband that the way I believe the sp spacecraft was navigated by direct intersection between the electronic waves generated within the minds of the pilots and the craft's directional controls. The electronic brain signals were interpreted and transmitted by the headband devices which served as interfaces. I never managed to obtain a copy of the Bethesda autopsy of the alien body the Navy received from General Twining. So he says, I never managed to obtain a copy of the autopsy uh, that the Navy received from General Twining. That's very important. I only had the Army report because remember, he was at the Pentagon and the only report he had was from the Army, or Army uh, you know, from the, from the entire military. Okay, so goes on to say the remaining bodies were kept in storage at Wright Field initially, then they were split up among the services. Okay, we're talking about the armed forces. When the Air Force be uh, became a separate branch of the service, the remaining bodies stored at Wright, also along with the spacecraft, were sent to Norton Air, uh, Air Force Base in California. So, and I've heard rumors of that too, guys, that it was sent to uh, the Norton air force base out of uh, california the remaining bodies stored at right along with the spacecraft were sent to norton air force base so there it is uh where the air force began uh, began experiments to replicate the technology of the vehicle this made this made sense the air force cared about the flight capabilities of the craft and how to build defenses against it. Experiments were carried out at Norton and ultimately at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada at the famous Groom Lake. Of course it was at the Groom Lake site where the stealth technology was developed. This continues to this very day, almost in plain sight for people with security clearances who are taken to where the vehicles are kept. Over the years, the replicated vehicles have become an ongoing inner circle saga among top-ranking military officers and members of the government, especially the favored senators and members of the House who vote along the military lines. Those who are shown the secrets are immediately bound to national security legislation and cannot reveal what they saw. Thus, the official camouflage is maintained despite the large number of people who really know the truth. I admit, I've never seen the craft at Norton with my own eyes, but enough reports passed across my desk during my years at Foreign Technology so that I knew what the secret was and how it was maintained. The craft was able to displace gravity through the propagation of mag magnetic waves controlled by shifting the magnetic poles around the craft so as to control or vector not a propulsion system but the repulsion force of like charges. Once they realized this, engineers at our country's primary defense contractors raced among themselves to figure out how the craft could retain its electrical capacity and how the pilots who navigated it could live within the energy field of a wave uh, let me let me go back and read that again guys okay that's very very important uh, defense contractors raced among themselves to figure out how the craft could retain its electric capacity and how the pilots who navigated it could live within the energy field of the wave. So I guess uh, they're referring to, you know, how do you survive inside this energy field? Goes on to say, but the nuts and bolts chance to land a multi-billion dollar developed development contract was very slim. The initial revelations into the nature of the spacecraft and its pilot's interface came very quickly during the first few years of testing at Norton, the Air Force discovered that the entire vehicle functioned just like a giant capacitor. In other words, the craft itself stored the energy necessary to propagate the magnetic wave that elevated it, allowed it to achieve escape velocity from the Earth's gravity, and enabled it to achieve speeds of over 7,000 miles per hour. Wow. Okay. Goes on to say the pilots weren't, they weren't affected by the tremendous G forces that built up in the acceleration of conventional aircraft because the aliens inside 
it was as if gravity was being folded around the outside of the wave that that enveloped the craft. And we've seen that in lots of photos. I mean, maybe you have. I know I have. Uh, it goes on to say, maybe it was like traveling inside the eye of a hurricane. Oh, I've never, that's very interesting. Maybe it was like traveling inside the eye of a hurricane. Very calm. Uh, but how did the pilots interface with the wave form they were generating so let me let me go back and read that guys maybe it was like traveling inside the eye of a hurricane but how did the pilots interface with the wave interface with the wave form they were generating i don't know i can't make sense of that but let's continue Okay, Corso goes on to say, I reported to General Trudeau that the secret to this system could be found in the single-piece skin-tight covering uh, spun around the aliens. The lengthwise atomic alignment of the strange fabric was a clue to me that somehow the pilots became part of the electrical storage and generation of the craft itself. So, the creatures were able to survive extended periods of living inside a high energy wave by becoming the primary circuit in the control of the wave. They were protected by their suits that enclosed them head to feet, but their suits enabled them to become one, of the ve one with the vehicle, literally part of the wave in 1947 this was a technology so new to us that it was as frightening as it was frustrating if we could only develop the power source necessary to generate a consistent well-defined magnetic magnetic wave around a vehicle we could harness a technology which would have sur surpassed all forms of, of rocket and jet propulsion Okay, Corso goes on to say, I pushed myself through the night to complete the report for the general. At least I wanted him to see that our strategy held out the probability that even in a basic evaluation of the, of the material we covered, the seeds were there for specific products. Again, these guys are always trying to make a profit uh, that we could develop, it goes on to say. I wanted to start the entire process by writing him a background report about the nature of the beings, okay, the nature of the aliens we'd autopsied, and what we could understand of the technology from an analysis of their spacecraft. By the time I finished, I was, by the time I finished, it was already just before sunup. So he's, you know, rushing to get this report uh, to the general. He says it was just before sunup and I looked like hell. This was the day I was going to drop my report on the general's desk. First thing, I'd snap right to attention in front of him and say, here's the report you've been waiting for, general. Confident it contained more than he ever thought it would because the subject was that new and complicated. But I wanted to be clean shaven and in a clean, crisp shirt, <laughs> uh, that's what I wanted. I didn't even need any sleep because my optimism and confidence at the moment were more powerful than anything a few hours of sleep could give me. Uh, so again, this is he's talking about giving this report to the general. He's ready. He's fired up. Didn't get a lot of sleep, but that's okay. Um, and it goes on to say, were secrets my predecessors had just begun to discover before they were stopped. Maybe it had been the Korean War. Maybe the CIA or other intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies had cast a pall over R&D's operation. But those days were over now. I was, I was at the foreign technology desk and the responsibility for this material, the Roswell material, was mine. Just like General Twining had said, it should have been 14 years ago. In those drawers, I found the puzzle pieces for a whole new age of technology. Thing that were that were only twinkles in the minds of engineers and scientists were right in front of me as hard as hard cold artifacts of an advanced culture. Wow! I mean, just imagine that. You're at a desk and you have this evidence, these artifacts, these documents of an alien race and all of their technology. So he goes on to say, craft that navigated by brain waves and floated on the wave of ele electromagnetic energies, creatures who took through devices that helped me turn night into day, okay, he's talking about the artifacts, and beams of light so narrow in focus you couldn't see them until they bounced off an object far away, talking about laser technology.
Okay, so we're going to go uh, go ahead and read the final chapter, or final page, rather, of chapter 7, The Day After Roswell. Now, you guys know, uh, if you saw the beginning of the video, that I said I would go over the points of interest and, uh, you know, anything that I, that I felt was you know noteworthy uh you know at the end of the video so after this particular page we're going to do just that very interesting riveting entertainment here guys okay for years the scientists scientists had thought about what it would have been like to travel or travel in space especially since the russians first put up their sputnik plans for the military operated moon base and by the way the moon base will be the topic of our next video uh developed an army developed by the army in the 1950s under the leadership of general trudeau at r d but were ultimately shelved because of the formation of nasa nasa it's always nasa right those plans had tried to confront the issues of space travel for prolonged periods of time and adjusting to a low gravity state of the moon. Hmm, interesting. But here, right in front of us, was the evidence of how an alien culture had adapted itself to long range space travel, different gravities, and the exposure to in in energy particles in waves crashing into the spacecraft by the billions with a B okay all we had to do was marshal the vast array of resources in the military and industry at R&D disposal and harvest that particular technology always you know reverse engineering of course uh, it was laid out for us if we if we knew how to use it this was the beginning and I was right there at the cusp of it says uh, Corso. Now, uh, on my phone, I took a few notes, like I said, uh, just points of interest that, you know, I kind of want to go over with you guys real quick, you know, things in chapter seven that, uh, you know, I thought was really cool. Okay, one of them, re uh, the retrieval of the art artifacts from the UFO. Uh, you know, where are they? Where are the documents? Where are the reports? What did they, what did they take? <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Um, memos and documents sent to general trudeau the autopsy report of the of the actual aliens you know i'd love to see the autopsy reports where are they uh the last known place of the downed ufo in corso said where it was being stored you know i'd love to see that you know again these are points of interest okay uh reverse engineering of fiber optics microchips lasers i mean all the things that uh that, that they discovered throughout the Roswell incident. The headbands that the aliens used to control the craft. Remember they said they, they, they put the headband on, right? And the military personnel put it on and they could see all these colors and different things. And, uh, you know, they felt um, like they, you know, just had some kind of connection with this headband. Like, like perhaps that's how the aliens were controlling their spacecraft. Um, uh, right here I wrote the aliens themselves acting as biological autopilots the suits that the aliens had wrapped around their bodies protecting them from space flight and space radiation you know kind of similar to our astronauts today and uh, the spacesuits that they're wearing by the way I want to go up to NASA in about a week and uh, bring you guys a video of the new spacesuits for the Artemis program so stay tuned for that on nocturnal news um, actually seeing the aliens suspended remember corso said he saw an alien suspended in a transparent mid-air crypt crypt right so you know really cool stuff here in uh, chapter seven and again next will be the moon base and uh what i you know i believe they did build a moon base on the moon and and all of this to me you can trace it back to the Roswell crash. I mean, uh, when you're looking at our technology, when you're looking at the current NASA programs, you know, even up to Artemis going from Gemini to Apollo to Artemis, all of it, I think, or a lot of it comes from NASA. And now, you know, these third party uh, contractors like the Bigelow Corporations and, and you know, uh, companies like that that are paid you know by nasa by the government by the pentagon to you know study this alien technology and the thing is they do this because they're protected under we can't uh use the foia act the freedom of information act against these third-party corporations because they're protected as private contractors therefore the government funds them okay so there's a lot you know there's a lot to take in and a, and a lot to learn uh on this amazing roswell journey again next we're going to talk about the moon base so uh thank you for tuning in and I'll see you on the next one.